Hello everyone! Today we're going to explore the kind of rock I'm most familiar with, as I've been surrounded by it for most of my life. It's an exceptionally common and exceptionally important rock type in the Earth's crust. As a bonus, it forms in the most spectacular style of any of them. Here on the hills surrounding Dunedin, a city in the south of New Zealand, you find plenty of this material, hard, crystalline and pitch black on fresh surfaces. Buildings have been made from it and roads paved with it. It's a rock known as basalt, and Dunedin is practically made of it. Now this is a geological map of the area surrounding the city. All the pink and red sections represent places where basalt and its related rocks are found in the ground. Together with offshore rock bodies, they define a structure some 25 kilometers across that once reached nearly one kilometer in height. Once we reverse the millions of years of erosion that created their modern irregular shape, we see a cone with a crater at the top. This is, of course, a volcano. When I tell people I live inside a volcano, they are often surprised or shocked. But this volcano is quite safe. It hasn't erupted for at least 9 million years. Because of all the erosion since then, the rocks that made up the volcano are now exposed for all to see, and they have quite a story to tell. This video is about how volcanic igneous rocks shape the Earth. Igneous rocks comprise one of the three major rock types, along with sedimentary and metamorphic. What's special about igneous rocks is that they're made from very, very hot material. In fact, the word igneous means fire formed. Allow me to explain. By their definition, rocks are solid materials. Like anything else, however, they can melt if enough heat is applied to them. Melting rocks produces a substance called magma, which is considered a liquid. Conversely, when magma is left to cool down, it will refreeze and crystallize to produce a new rock. That rock is an igneous rock, one that cooled from a molten state. The subject of melting and cooling rocks is a fascinating topic on its own, but for now I just want to focus on the products. Generally, igneous rocks form in places where molten rock is able to collect and crystallize in significant amounts. This volcano is about volcanic igneous rocks, which form in, you guessed it, volcanic eruptions. But wait a minute, if these rocks are produced by cooling down magma, how can they form in a volcanic eruption? Volcanoes tend to be very hot, after all. Well, that's true, but they are only hot by our standards. The truth is that magma is an extremely hot substance. The magma that produced this basalt, for example, had a temperature of around 1200 degrees when it breached the Earth's surface. It was even hotter beforehand, as it rose up through the Earth's crust, inching closer and closer to the top of this volcano. When it erupted from the volcano, it met the atmosphere, which is incredibly cold by comparison. That sharp difference in temperature triggered rapid cooling, and the magma became lava, launching itself into the open air and crystallizing to form new rocks. To be clear, magma and lava are two different terms for similar things. Magma is molten rock found anywhere inside the Earth. Lava is magma that has been exposed to the Earth's atmosphere. From now on, I will only use the term lava because all volcanic rocks are formed by the solidification of lava. Volcanic rocks come in a variety of styles, colors, and textures. They can be classified based on their composition, the minerals that make them up. This also affects how the lava itself is erupted, so different volcanic rocks tend to be found in different types of volcanoes. For example, the volcano that Dunedin is built inside was a shield volcano, much like the island shields of Hawaii that still erupt today. Volcanoes of this type usually erupt in a gentle style called effusive, which means that lava oozes out of them in a steady stream. 
Such lava is runny, hot, and doesn't contain much gas. It commonly forms basalt or obsidian, which is a rock made up of natural glass. Other volcanoes tend to be more explosive. Mount Tambora in Indonesia, for example, underwent an eruption in 1815 that was big enough to alter the climate. This happened because it was filled with sticky, gas-rich lava that burst into the atmosphere as ash, which blocked out the sunlight and led to a global cooling period. The following year was named the Year Without a Summer, and it witnessed the worst crop failures of the century. Today, Tambora is marked by the rocks it left behind. Not just ash deposits, but also mounds of pumice, andesite, and rhyolite. By now I'm sure you have a few questions. Why do some volcanoes erupt effusively, and others explosively? How does this relate to the makeup of volcanic rocks? And just what minerals are inside those rocks? Let's dive into the answers now. They actually tie together in a satisfying way. If we grade volcanic rocks based on composition, we get a spectrum like this. At one end we have basalt, at the other, rhyolite. These rocks are made up of minerals such as quartz, feldspar, mica, and pyroxene. We can also insert obsidian and pumice like this. These rocks are composed of natural glass, which is not a mineral, although it also forms by solidification from lava. At the basaltic end of the spectrum, rocks contain a high proportion of pyroxene and perhaps some olivine. These are dense minerals rich in the elements iron and magnesium, which give the rocks dark coloration. By contrast, rocks at the rhyolitic end contain a higher proportion of quartz and feldspar. These are less dense minerals that tend to give the rocks a pale color scheme. Other minerals, such as mica and amphibol, are especially prevalent in intermediate rocks like andesite. Believe it or not, the composition of lava has a huge impact on how it's erupted from a volcano. First, let's consider how rhyolite erupts. This kind of rock is usually the result of explosive events where massive volumes of material are blasted into the atmosphere. The reason for the explosivity is the high proportion of quartz in rhyolite rocks. The atoms that make up quartz have a strong attraction toward one another, even in the liquid state. When they are floating around in a body of lava, they tend to stick together even before they're cool enough to crystallize. This makes the lava as a whole more sticky. It is viscous and doesn't flow easily. As a side effect of the stickiness, the lava also becomes very good at trapping gases like carbon dioxide and water vapor. If those gases are trapped for long enough and experience enough pressure, they will burst violently and trigger an explosive eruption like the catastrophe at Mount Tambora. On the other side of the spectrum, we have rocks that form in effusive eruptions, such as basalt. These rocks contain less quartz and more of those dense metal-rich minerals like pyroxene. The dominant minerals in basalt don't stick together as readily as quartz does, so the lava they are made from flows much more easily. Basaltic lava can still trap some amounts of gas and make a fountain every now and then, but for the most part it oozes steadily along the ground. Of course, volcanoes are very complex systems, and there's more going on than I am presenting here. I don't want this video to go on forever, so I'll be making a separate one all about volcanic eruptions. Keep an eye out for that if you want to learn more. For now, let's examine some more places where volcanic rocks occur and their effects on the landscape. If there's one place every volcano lover should visit, it's here. Iceland sits on a rift between two tectonic plates, where the Earth's crust is being forced apart. In the space between those plates, rocks melt and rise up into the ocean, where they are chilled to form basalt and obsidian. Millions of years of this activity has built up not only Iceland, but the entire floor of the Atlantic Ocean that surrounds it. This is one of the most geologically active areas on the planet. Many of Iceland's rock formations have interesting forms. Take a look at this one, for example. Those vertical columns are giant rods of basalt, each with a hexagonal cross-section. 
They fit together like the cells in honeycomb. How do you think these were formed? Back when this basalt was hot and molten, it collected in a literal lake of lava. That lake gradually cooled and crystallized from bottom to top. As the lava cooled, it also had to shrink, since solid rocks take up less space than the liquid they are made from. Therefore, the lava cracked into columns. The space between the columns represents the difference between solid and liquid volumes. The original lava lake must have been impressive indeed, at least 20 meters deep to form these. A volcanic rock we've touched on only briefly is andesite. It's named for the Andes, a mighty mountain range that stretches along the spine of South America. These mountains also sit near a boundary between two tectonic plates, but these plates are being pushed together not forced apart like in the Atlantic Ocean. The processes that take place here produce different types of lava, including andesitic lava. It erupts from volcanoes all along the continent, in a style more explosive than basalt, but more gentle than rhyolite. Andesite tends to be lighter in colour than basalt, which allows you to see individual mineral grains, although you might need a hand lens. The lighter minerals in this sample are composed of quartz and feldspar, while the darker ones are pyroxene or amphibole. In this sample, from my own collection, the darker grains are pretty obvious. They are large amphibole crystals surrounded by a fine matrix of quartz, feldspar, mica and other minerals. The reason for this size difference is that amphibole crystallizes at a higher temperature than the others. As a sample of lava cools to form this rock, the amphibole crystals formed first, and were given enough time to grow until the lava completely solidified, at which point the other minerals crystallized quickly and entrapped them. Geologists have a precise name for everything, and their name for this appearance is a porphyritic texture. Finally, let's look at one more place where rhyolite is common. The Taupo Volcanic Zone in northern New Zealand is a strip of land famous for explosive eruptions. Some of them occurred on a scale similar to Mount Tambora. For instance, this lake sits at the remains of a crater that blew up roughly 26,000 years ago. Other eruptions have been recent and disastrous, such as the 2019 eruption of White Island, in which 20 lives were lost. Clearly, this part of the world poses dangers to human life, so it's vital that we understand the processes going on here and the rocks they form. Within the Topol Volcanic Zone, rich deposits of rhyolite and pumice can be found. You may know pumice as the lightest of all rocks. It is filled with air sacs, where volcanic gases were once trapped, dramatically lowering its density. As a result, pumice is able to float in water. There are also extensive layers of tuff, a rock made from compacted ash. Tuff is very soft for a volcanic rock, so it has been carved and used as a construction material since Roman times. All of these rocks were produced by the same sticky type of lava, exploding and showering the surrounding land. After countless episodes of violence and destruction, this extraordinary landscape was left behind. Let's summarize. You should now be comfortable explaining how volcanic igneous rocks form and what they are formed from. You should also be able to name the most common volcanic rocks and distinguish them based on their mineral makeup. Finally, you should know how the makeup of these rocks relates to the style of eruption that created them. I hope you enjoyed watching this presentation as much as I enjoyed making it. Feel free to leave a comment below if you have any questions, comments or suggestions for future videos. You can also like the video, share it with your friends and subscribe to my channel if you wish. More videos like this are on the way, so stay tuned. Thank you for watching!